Well, I must ask a question. When we think of Christmas, is there something that it puts upon us? Now, I'm not talking about salvation or redemption and grace, although those are parts of it. When we think of Christmas, does anyone think of waiting? Does anybody think of, okay, I'm going to stand here a while, or okay, I'm going to go all the way across the country to the other side because there's this special event. Does anybody think of the pause one takes? Why would we take a pause at Christmas? Today we're going to go and have a look at something very interesting about Jesus' birth and Christmas. It is the waiting, it is the pause that existed at Jesus' birth. Now because it's Christmas and because I have two captured audience members here that are young, I'm going to pick on them for a minute. We're going to make an example of how they think. You know, kids say the darndest things. I remember a TV show about that when I was very young. They do say crazy things, and they do mean serious things by it. Sometimes it's humorous, so we're going to look at a couple here. One young man wrote a letter to Santa, and he said, Dear Santa, when you come to my house, there'll be cookies for you. But if you're real hungry, you can use our phone and order pizza. <laughs> Another one said, Dear Santa, I want a puppy. I also want a playhouse. Thank you. I've been good most of the time. Sometimes I'm wild. I feel like I have met that child. Dear Santa, this is from a four-year-old. I'll take anything because I haven't been good. <laughs> and then there's, Dear Santa, I'm not going to ask for a lot. Here's my list. Etch-a-sketch animator, two packs of number two pencils, Crayola fat markers, and the big gift, my own color TV. Well, maybe you could drop the pencils. I don't want to be really selfish. <laughs> to me, it's fascinating how kids relate to Christmas, how they relate to the idea of Santa Claus, and how they relate to presents and gifts. I remember my very first Christmas that I was able to retain the memories of, and it was fascinating. My mom and dad went out and bought me a brand new state-of-the-art Lionel train set that had grain elevators that worked. It had the log loading and unloading contraptions. It had switches. It had buildings and lights. And the best part, the engine made smoke, and it had a real whistle. My dad soon learned that it probably would have been better to get a far less fancy train set as Mom was always making Kool-Aid and feeding half the neighborhood. The other thing I remember is that my mom took the time to cut plywood and sand it and put it together and hand paint it. And I was given a complete farm, the main barn with a real hayloft in it, a real hay fork on a real string that lifted bales up, Fences, pigs, cows, goats, sheep, you name it, my mom made that by hand, and that was my Christmas gift. That went to my sister's son, and uh, from there I don't know what happened to it, but I remember the giving, and I remember the anticipation. What am I going to get? If you ask again, you're not going to get a caramel apple. Okay, but what am I going to get? <laughs> I was looking at it 
in a selfish way. Children do that. I was also looking at it in a but I don't want to wait way. I was looking at it very much anticipating what the surprise would be because the surprise was very important. Now, when it comes to God's plan for my, mankind, we know what the surprise is and was. It's Jesus. But have you ever thought what it was like to be present and to hear this rumor of the King of Kings in this baby and to know that if this was in fact what God had promised, it would transform lives. Now, what are we waiting for individually right now? I'm asking this rhetorically. Eileen, what are you waiting for this Christmas? Miss Barry, what are you waiting for this Christmas? Deborah, we probably know what she waited for, and that was to get back here. <laughs> and we're glad to have her. I can ask my brother Curtis, what are you waiting for? Now, when we think of that waiting, we can go to get a glimpse of what it is about and what I'm talking about by going to the book of Luke. We come across two characters who make their appearance in the final acts of the Christmas drama. One of the man, the man is named Simeon and the woman is named Anna. Does anybody remember their stories? So Simeon receives insight, a vision that he will not perish, but he will meet the Lord, the Savior, before his death. Would that be worth waiting for? Absolutely. What do you suppose Simeon's reaction was when he realized, I'm going to meet he who was foretold? Put yourself in his shoes for a minute awestruck maybe at the fact that he's feeling I am a lowly human and look what I'm going to be blessed with now don't answer this but let me ask does anybody remember what Simeon did when he got to go and meet Jesus as an infant Okay, we're going to go forward from there. Anna, does anybody remember her story? She was a prophetess. She was a widow. A widow. Her life was spent in the temple daily, hourly, no one else was doing what she was doing. She was communicating with the Creator minute by minute, hour by hour, day after day. Now, the Holy Spirit obviously had a part in reaching out to Simeon and giving him that insight. Let's look at what Simeon had happen here. The Holy Spirit prompted Simeon to go to the temple courts and just at the right time, on just the right day, that Joseph and Mary were bringing their infant to the temple. When Simeon looked at the baby Jesus, now about six weeks old, he knew that God's promise had been kept. What was the promise? And it was also the promise of Emmanuel, God with us, 
having been given, to make everything right, to prove significance by his presence, and to eliminate rejection and fear and loneliness. Do you suppose Simeon felt a little bit pushed to the outside, isolated? Look at what he could have been thinking. Look at what Simeon was relating to. God, I just want to see. I just want to see the gift and the gift giver and bringer, and I'll be okay. We don't read anything else about anyone else in that part of the story other than Simeon. Alone, isolated from others, obviously in the community and in humanity, but very, very blessed to see the promise that had been given that would save mankind. Now, later on, we find the story of Anna, and it might be called Waiting for Forgiveness. Here's Simeon who is seeking comfort, the comforter, the blessing of knowing and witnessing and taking a deep breath and say, this part of the story has begun. There was comfort in that for him in knowing that. The other Christmas character, Anna, was waiting with anticipation. After her husband had died, she dedicated herself to fasting and praying in the temple. In fact, the Bible says that she never left the temple but worshipped day and night. She could have filled 365 slots of Bible reading in a marathon all by herself. She was dedicated. What do you suppose the powers that be at the temple thought? This woman. Do you suppose they thought the men are supposed to be doing that? Think culturally. In the time and in the country that she was in, men had a role that was more prominent than women. And here she is, not caring about culture and normalcy, but going and spending time with God. Like I said, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. She was looking forward to the same person as Simeon, but with a different need, with a different relation humanly. Instead of looking for comfort, Anna was looking for forgiveness. Now, does it uh, seem obvious to us? Do we see it as, what? I expected that. That they're relating to a Jesus who comforts and a Jesus who forgives and heals. To me, that seems obvious. It seems like Okay, that should be part of the plan and part of the story. Take a look at verse 38 of Luke 2, and it basically says, Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. What did we just read she was, did? She worshipped. She praised. She gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. You know, if you go back and catch up in the Simeon story, Simeon looked at the baby Jesus, now about six weeks old. He knew that God's promise had been kept. He was Emmanuel, God with us to make everything right, to provide significance by his presence to the promises, to the stories that have been handed down family after family. 
And with that significance in his presence, he would begin to teach the rejection of sin and the rejection of false teaching. With that, loneliness would be replaced with comforting love from God through Jesus. Now, when we think of Simeon and Anna, and we think of rejoicing, we think of them coming to see the baby Jesus, what would you think if you had your new baby in your arms and some crazy old man walked up and took the baby out of your arms and started singing praises and worshiping God and saying these sayings that some knew what they meant. Not everybody understood what Simeon was uh, worshiping about. But what do you suppose Joseph and Mary thought when this man approached them and did that? Do you suppose they were kind of shocked? What's that, Nancy? Maybe, alarmed. Maybe a little bit alarmed. I would agree. Curtis. I think by now, though, they're just amazed at what's really happening because Mary's already been witnessed by her, her aunt. And then there's the thing that Joseph understood by his witness mm -hmm. and the people. So I think now it's just overwhelmed by the reality of seeing this and being a part of it. It's just and it was kind of hard to believe, but yet you believe it. We've established the fact that the baby was kind of uh, the baby of babies, the rumors, the past history, the teachings, the promises. And here's mom and dad. Here's this wonderful, beautiful girl who says, you know, to the angel, okay, whatever he wants, count me in, I'm there. I'll do it. And they go forward and things happen. I agree. I believe there was not immense shock when this happened. Now, Anna, when she had this experience, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Israel. What did that just tell us? She was sharing. She was telling all who looked forward to the redemption of Israel. Who would all who looked forward be? Her people? Her community? The people that lived under the promises. The promises of the Old Testament. And here's this woman who breaks her ritual and goes and does this, this thing that no doubt if there were others watching, they were going, what? And here she is worshiping God, doing her thing. What was Simeon and Anna doing and saying with their worship when they came and saw the baby and acknowledged it? Do you think as we learned a couple of weeks back, their actions were saying thanks be to God without using the words thanks be to God. Maybe they did use those words. But worship and thanksgiving. Now look at the order of importance here. I need to go see this baby, said a man and a woman. And then I need to praise and offer something to God. My worship, my thanks. Now in this time of the year, in this Christmas season, do we think in those terms? 
Do we think of acknowledging Jesus, his birth, his life, with first off, right out of the box, as soon as we become mindful of that spiritual thing we call Jesus, the love of God in our Christian life, do we think of worshiping and praising? We should. But I find myself missing that, being trapped in the commercialism briefly. I find myself being trapped in the sentimental part of Christmas. And then it sneaks up on me and all of a sudden I get goosebumps and the hair stands up in the back of my neck. And I realize I have missed the primary thing that Simeon and Anna understood. I have missed acknowledging the blessing, the gift, the comfort that God gave in his son. And at this time in Christmas, that's what we celebrate. We celebrate the birth of our Lord, our Savior, the King of Kings. And you know, when Jesus walked the earth, he was here. Duh. <laughs> We understand that. But we also have a promise of him returning. Doesn't the Bible say he lives in and through us now and we live by and through him now? Did he return? Maybe not in physical body, but in spirit. Another important spiritual promise fulfilled. And do we think of singing Worshiping, praising in that moment? Not all the time. Some of us might identify with Simeon. Loneliness, isolation could come after the loss of a mate or a friend. It could come because you're different in some way and you're isolated. But in that isolation, that being different, in a situation a person lives in, there is great comfort that comes through and by and from Jesus. Great comfort. I've personally had some experiences that astonish me at the, the greatness that God can perform a miracle and remove that feeling that I have and place a feeling of love that grows and bubbles over, and then i got to go share it. I can't sit idly by. It's kind of like Anna telling everybody who's looking forward to this redemption of a country and a people. Some of us might identify with Anna. Are we plagued with guilt at Christmas? Are we plagued with apathy and not caring at Christmas? Are we plagued with sorrow because of a loss at Christmas? I can't think of a better time to find comfort and peace and tranquility than at Christmas. I can't think of a better time to receive promises and the knowing absolutely that God's going to honor and fulfill what he said for his people. And we are those people. We are part of that family. Now, if we're going to acknowledge Christ's birth, we can have a manger scene. We can have a nativity scene. But is it the same as the experience Simeon and Anna had? It's not going to be because the nativity isn't alive. It's a metaphor as well as a representation of fact. But nonetheless, Christmas is important. Now, if you were to become something at Christmas, what would it be? What does the story of Simeon and Anna point us to? becoming. What do you suppose their mental thoughts were when they saw the baby, the baby was held and they started worshiping? Do you think they marveled 
at what they were holding, who they were holding. So at Christmas, the first thing we're called to is become marvelers, to marvel at what God has done, to marvel at and through what Jesus has done and is doing. When Joseph and Mary tried to process everything that was happening, we can read in Luke 2, verse 33, that they marveled at what was said about Jesus according to the dictionary. To become a marveler is to be filled with wonder, astonishment, and surprise. To be a marveler. You know, a while back I talked about, are you a luck and chance kind of a person, or are you a signs and wonders kind of a person? Myself, over the years, I've become a signs and wonders person. But to be filled with wonder, astonishment, and surprise at Christmas, what does one need to be in that mindset in today's world? Go ahead, Eileen. Okay, the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit doing that is so important? It's also the comforter. It teaches. It leads. Does the Holy Spirit offset or change anything when it comes to the Christmas season? How many of us hear a song and all of a sudden we don't go from Jesus, we go to Perry Como, Andy Williams, a story, a time, an event with family. The world bombards us and strips us of the truth of the spiritual event of Christmas. In many, many, many cases. There is a few cases, however, where Christmas is Christ-centric and it takes us to that point of remembering Jesus. Are we marvelers this Christmas? Are we people who just immerse ourselves in the glory and the greatness that is Jesus? And in his blessings and in the gift of his life, our salvation and our guarantee for life. This time of year can also be dangerous. The annual celebration of Christmas can immunize us to reality. What does that look like in this day and age? After two more incidents like San Bernardino, do you think people are going to care and they're going to want to see it on the news and they're going to want to stop and pray for it? This world desensitizes us and makes it feel normal. And it puts us in a position of not caring intimately. But yet, in this season, we should be intimate. Now, if I say more so than other times, is that correct? To remember and have a remembrance is good. We should be mindful all the time. But in this time of year, we should be overtly acknowledging the birth of Christ and acknowledging his life and telling people who it matters that they hear that message of hope. You know, now's a good time to plug... Uh, something that New Hope is well known for. Christmas Day, December 25th, the Simone community is going to come in all their loving, kind-hearted, beautiful attitudes, and they're going to make breakfast for whoever wants to come and eat. What? Samoan food. Samoan food this year. Not potatoes and eggs per se, but Samoan food. And then, December 25th at 6 p.m., right here, 
We're going to have a church service for all of our friends that live on the street and live in the woods, for anybody else who wants to come. It's going to be built around singing songs, offering praise and thanksgiving, praying for and with and over people, interceding on their behalf with the purpose of giving them the same experience that we've come to take for granted. So after we become marvelers, what might be next? To become a mover? If becoming a marveler is an action step, step two is to become a mover. If we look at verse 27 in Luke 2, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And then we drop down to verse 38. Coming up to them at that very moment, and she gave thanks to God. We are also called to be movers who give thanks to God, who acknowledge the gift, who moving implies no longer residing at point A, but residing somewhere else in that moment. Movers move. They might go from here to there or there to here or whatever, but they move. And moving puts us amongst, with, around other people. If we're moved by the Spirit, what do we do? When the Spirit calls on us and moves us, what do we do? We move, we do what it is asked, we acknowledge that, and we seek to know what else is needed. Both Simeon and Anna were movers, and when the Holy Spirit prompted them, they did move. I wonder what would have happened if they had not responded. They moved. They went to where Jesus was as a new baby. Mary was ready to move when she said to the angel, May it be to me as you have said. She moved towards fulfillment by being not only the vessel and the conduit, but by also being the means for making that happen. You know, when uh, God prompts us to do something, we need to do it. Does anybody know the difference, or can you identify a difference between God prompting you and the Holy Spirit prompting you? Dave? I think they're, at least in my view, they're both the same thing. For some, it would be true. I have found that the Holy Spirit pricks me in my heart or in my brain and causes me to move on something to commit an action. But when God does it, it tends to always be when I'm reading the Bible, studying or meditating. And it almost always comes out of what's in the paper, the ink that are words. When God says something to me, it's historical. It's been written down. But the Holy Spirit tends to point out the obvious. So when I get called upon to move, I move. It wasn't always that way. But you know what? Today, in our day and age, if we're called on by the Holy Spirit or by God to move, we should move. We should move. Because how does thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven occur if somebody doesn't do it and doesn't move? What would the third action item be regarding Christmas, Christ's birth, the baby Jesus being given? We've talked about becoming an, a marveler, praising, worshiping, giving thanks. Moving, becoming a mover. The third one is to use our voices and become a messenger. 
Become a messenger for truth and light, for the holy word, the gospel. Become a messenger that shares the influence of the Holy Spirit with others. Become a messenger that tells the story of the Gospels. It tells the story of Jesus and how he affected people, mankind, so great. You know, one of the greatest things about being a messenger is that you get to point out in a discussion from time to time that there is no other man ever that has changed the world as much or in the way that Jesus did. There is no one else that's done that. So when we're the messenger, we're pointing out the promise, the action, the taking it away from where we are outwardly and using our voices, our actions, our words, to tell and share what we know with others. Now, one of the things that we're known for around here is we're known to not take our Bible and beat people over the head with it. Bible thumping. <laughs> By the way, in case you didn't detect it, Deborah had a she had a true aversion to Bible thumping at all costs. And I really was blessed to watch her work through that and become who she is now. But we're known for being the living gospel, sharing the living gospel, being the messenger. The messenger that we're called to be in the family of saints we call the church. The body of believers we call Christians. As we all, each one of you, as I, as I become a marveler, a mover, and a messenger, even more so, as we all do this together, remember, Christmas is a time of astonishment and marveling. Don't allow the trappings of this world to capture your heart and your mind. Don't allow commercialism to erode your spiritual focus. Now, I'm not saying all things that are done professionally are bad, but I'm saying don't be misled and taken away from the focal point of marvelers who are messengers. And the focal point is to tell and share the story of Jesus. Don't become knocked off course. Don't become fooled. Ephesians 4 talks about coming to the full measure of Jesus Christ within us, in our lives, that we're not knocked back and forth and tripped up and confused by every word that's spoken and taught by just anybody. We know the truth. We know how to focus on it. We know how to live in that. So in conclusion here, I want to uh, tell you a very brief story. Many years ago, there was a wealthy man who shared a passion for art collection with his son. And they had priceless works by Picasso and Van Gogh in their very nicely adorned family estate. And one day, as winter approached, war engulfed the nation, and the man's son was killed in the war. And after that, distraught and lonely, the old man faced the incoming Christmas holidays with anguish and sadness. The joy of the season had been stripped away. On Christmas morning, there was a knock at the door. It awakened the old man, and he walked to the door. The masterpieces of art on the walls only reminded him that his son was not coming home. And there in the door was another young man 
who had been present with the old man's son. I was a friend of your son. I was the one he was rescuing when he died. May I come in for a few moments? I have something to show you. So the soldier mentioned that he was an artist and he gave the man a package. And the paper gave way to reveal a portrait of the man's son. Now the guy wasn't a great and beautiful painter, but it showed who the son was in a very significant way. And through the time going on, it came to the point where it was time to fulfill the will that the old man had left, and that was to auction off all the artwork. And the auctioneer came, and the people gathered, and the people got anxious, and they got frustrated. Let's get this going. We want to see the, the really important artwork. And the auctioneer started and said, okay. We'll start with this painting done by a friend of the son. Who'll bid $100? And they only got one bid for 20 bucks. And after the auctioneer gaveled his comments three or four times, nobody offered more. And so the auctioneer said, you, sir, have bought the painting. And then everybody said, well, let's, let's get on with this and get to the real painting. And the auctioneer said, you don't understand. When you took the son, he pointed at the man who bid the $20. When you took the son, you got everything else. So it is in our lives with Jesus. You take the son, you get everything. That's what Christmas is about. So as we go forward in the weeks to come, as we sing more songs, as we remember more people, and we hear from them and talk to them, as we have our memories, don't lose track of how marvelers respond to Jesus' birth, how movers respond with the truth of what that birth means, and how messengers share what the marvelers and the movers no, those messengers are no different than the pages in the book we call the Bible.